Welcome to Connecting Chats. Today we're going to be talking with Giel Buscher, all the way from the Netherlands. Giel is going to be talking to us about his experiences as a workshop leader, music facilitator, composer, drummer, music producer, songwriter, clarinetist, collaborator, Here we go. We are live with Mr. Gio. Welcome to Connecting Chats, Gio. You all right? Welcome. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. That's all right. Very, very good uh, to have someone from the Netherlands with us. That's very cool. Yay! <laughs> all the way from the attic in... Good. Did you hear that sound? I heard it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That was uh, some something went got wrong a bit here, but it's okay. We <laughs> can start now. So, tell us, Gil, amazing producer, workshop leader, teacher, blah, 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 blah. Tell us, who are you? Where are you from? And tell us a bit more about you. About me. Well, in really short, I'm Giel from the Netherlands and I am a composer, songwriter, a music producer and collaborator. Um, and all those terms are slightly ambiguous as in they happen with a lot in a lot of contexts and a lot of ways with a lot of people. So it, yeah, I do a lot of creative things with a lot of people, I guess. Yeah. That's cool. And, and, and going like before we start talking about your practice as a, a workshop leader, a community musician that you do loads uh, nowadays, as I, as I know, um, tell us, can you tell us a little bit about your, your music education and how you became all of those things that you just described? Yes. Well, probably most unexpectedly, I grew up as a clarinet player. Um, I really oh, played wow. clarinet from the age of six or seven, I think. Um, I, just, I just forgot to ask you the name of your town, your city in, in the Netherlands. Right, I'm now in Rotterdam. Yeah, yeah, but you grew up in? in uh, I grew up in Emmen, which is in Drenthe. It's a bit more the countryside. It's a small sort of working class city. Um, it's It's tiny comparative to anything I've lived in after. Um, there's like three main bars that everyone in Emmen goes to and there's like 200,000 <laughs> people in Emmen. It's like there's, there's loads of people, but the city center is really small. So there's not very much happening. Um, All right. At least when I grew up um, since then, there's been quite some development, but I'm not that very okay, is that, is that So tell me about the clarinet then. So that's where you started then? Yeah, yeah, so at the local music school, um, I had a teacher who was super fun and could stay, yeah, keep me engaged. Um, I think that was quite important because, um, yeah, I, I had quite an affinity with music from the beginning. Um, so I played clarinet, was in orchestra, orchestras and ensembles. Um, and then um, when I was 15, 16, I had to choose what to do next. Like in England, you finish and you go to your A-levels and stuff. And I had to choose my A-levels, I guess, comparison. Um, and this new studies just came up, which was teaching assistant with a specialization in music. So you can like teach music to a primary school kids. Oh, ah, nice. Um, but it was the only music course available to me in from that age, kind of. So it's pre-conservatoire. Um, so I went and did that, and um, it was because it was the I was the first in the first sort of generation of that course. Um, they were very flexible with what we wanted uh, to do and wanted to be, and they built a studio in this on the side of a classroom, and you know it was quite cool. Um, so I ended up just being lots, like spending lots of time on computers and creating music and creating loops and doing that kind of stuff, um, as well as playing clarinet. 
but like in my head these things sort of slowly became to rise on a par of interest um until at one point um i just kind of made the call for myself that i was going to be studying songwriting i was going to be a singer songwriter that's what i first set out to be um that that thing got destroyed pretty quickly because uh, i'm not i i had no singing experience no singing lessons whatsoever so i was just there going like ah! Uh, with a guitar or a piano and yeah that was pretty bad um, <laughs> but I had a lot of fun and I saw you know the music made sense to me um, so from there on I went to conservatoire but they didn't allow me to be a singer songwriter they said you're going to study composition and music production because I did do all the music production for the songs I wrote and all of that stuff all right. Um, and songwriting, I studied it like it was a sort of three part composition, songwriting, um, and uh, music production, studio production. Um, but I, I wasn't a singer, um, which in the end is probably for the best. <laughs> uh, I think you have a lovely singing voice, man. You uh, know, the thank you. stuff I've yeah. seen you singing. <laughs> It's very yeah, nice. No, I do. I mean, I do enjoy singing, and I think, yeah, I, at that point, I was not at any level, and I'd never been because I I grew up in this small town, and then I went yeah. to study in another small town. I'd never been around people who, who actually, did what I wanted to do. I think. That's yeah, I'm curious. Uh, on the radio. Yeah, I'm curious to to kind of see you. Uh, playing in uh, in the early early stages of your clarinet learning, like was it was that mainly like classical music for orchestra? Did you do like any kind of informal learning as well, playing folk music from somewhere, or I don't know, like rock music or something? Mm. I um, uh, it was mainly classical music. I was trained as a classical player. Um, but then there was there was a jazz ensemble in the local music right, school yeah. that I was uh, a part of. Um, yeah, and um, like whenever there was a chance to sort of improvise, I was always kind of up for it without any knowledge of how to, but just like going winging it and having a good time. But yeah, yeah, yeah. that's in cool. The there's no but it was. No, it's tell me. Sorry, go in on. In the Netherlands, there's not a, a massive folk scene, folk music scene. Oh, no, so, yeah. Um, I didn't. Um, and I, yeah, I never really got in touch with that until, with folk music as a, as a thing until I then went to London and met all these people who played folk music and were amazing. Yeah. And uh, now I'm just thinking like you learn everything then from kind of from the sheets and reading first and then improvising or... Yeah performing or memorize cool so yeah. so like i you know because i know you so well now learn uh, leading workshops in such a different ways is it's very interesting to see your journey from like learning from the sheet and then going to doing something that is completely not reading from any score or anything right yeah 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 um it's an interesting it's also for me um i was because I grew up as a classical player and with the training and theory, I was really comfortable in, in approaching things from a theoretical angle. Mm. And um, up to the point where I got asked not to, I never really considered not to do that in that same way. So that, yeah, it's an interesting one. And did you, so, so then like, did you have a, a kind of a, a musician's life before you moved to the UK in terms of performing or um, working as a musician, you know, or a producer or anything, or did you move to the UK straight after that? So, um, <laughs> so in conservatoire, I set up a German bass orchestra called Funk. Um, oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, there might be some stuff lingering on YouTube still, but I don't think there's much left of that. Um, and um, 
Well, the the orchestra was a, a combination of contemporary classical music with a drum and bass band and just like the drum and bass vibes of like rapping, singing, all of that, like together. Amazing. But I want to hear that. 18 people. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was cool. And we, we did a few really cool gigs. Um, and then it started going really quite well and I got quite a bit of interest from, from like um, people who were like, yeah, you should do more with this. Um, and at that point, I was like, because I was running it as a business as well as a, a creative outlet. Um, and I wanted it to be more free, but also um, because I was so used to writing theoretically. So I wrote out, wrote out all the scores for everyone. Um, but I, yeah, I didn't really know how to, how to make it a more sensible, free experience for the musicians on stage that I wanted it to be. So <clears throat> I chose to go to London to learn more about that. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's sort of cool. escape uh, the, the sort of pressures that I felt that kind of, uh, that, that shape of practice um, put on me. Um, yeah. By being successful, but not really knowing what to do next. You know, yeah, yeah. I needed to know more before I made made choices, I guess. And then was that in, so? You didn't do any work as a as a workshop leader before. No, well, in no, this band, no. maybe a little bit. Maybe did you did you do any kind of workshop leading with this band? It was just like the heroes. Yeah, your well, not. I mean, I led the band. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And I was like a, a leader in that sense. And I did yeah. do a few workshop weeks and, and project weeks here and there. Yeah. Um, and I met the people that actually got me into looking into going to uh, London. Yeah. Um, so I met Joe Wills. I met um, Sean. I met um, Sean Gregory, as in Sean Gregory. Sean yeah. Gregory, yeah. Um, he worked with Funk actually for for a different thing, but yeah, it was that I met I met a few people and then well, I also ended up sig, uh, meeting Sigrun, who then uh, was like, oh. "You should you should come to London." Yeah. Oh, that's nice. And then so then you started doing actual like community work, community music work, workshop leading in London. Then, um, yeah. What what was kind of like your your first steps on that world? Um, because I went through the leadership course, um, a lot of that happened in um, sort of controlled environments. Um, so my very first steps were just in projects that the Guildhall set up for me to do as a student. Yeah, so the leadership course, just so everybody is aware, is the, is the masters that you did at Guildhall. Yes. Uh, yeah. That we did at Guildhall and um, that's where we met. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that it's a master's that focused for me at least. Uh, I think it's a sort of different experience for everyone that yeah. goes through it. But for me, it, I was focusing focusing on creative collaboration. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so these controlled environments were pretty set up. I could uh, like I got given a class full of kids, like most likely with other like, colleague students. And they said, like, you have to make a certain thing of this amount of minutes of this. And so step by step, um, I found my way in that. But also I was part of uh, just assisting in a load of projects. And I think that gave me a, a real scope of what is possible. Learned loads from being a part of Future Band, uh, from Detta, Lampert and, uh, and Natasha. Yeah. Um, I've, and then I got in touch with Drumworks. Cool, so yeah. That, that, I'm, still, I'm still a part of yeah. Yeah. This is something I really want to talk to you about today. Um, Drumworks is, uh, yeah, tell us about, I know, I, I probably know a lot about it, but it's, uh, it would be good to hear from someone inside about, you know, like what is the kind of, the aims of the projects and everything and, and who leads and the team and everything, that'd be great. Everything. Everything, um, starting yeah. now. Drumworks is set up 
um, by uh, back like 11 years ago by the Barbican uh, Center by the creative learning department um, in collaboration with uh, back then Morpeth School and Ross McDowell and Joe Wills and they were collaborating with um, a Brazilian samba band that came over um, and they were given all these drums and they were like yeah you do this project with these drums and then the Brazilian people left and the drums stayed and they were like so what should we do now and that's sort of the first initial spark of drum work I guess um, and that project um, has developed so pretty soon they uh, realized that because they were not Brazilians they shouldn't teach Brazilian music because they had no knowledge of it so they were um, they were both very much into um, uh, London or for a better word urban um, electronic music and so they started working um, that and the interest of the the, 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 the people they worked with um, in into uh, the music that they wrote together so throughout um, Drumworks has written loads of beats together mm. um, and the ideas have come from the people we work with and um, from the people who lead their experience and it's in mainly teenagers or is that is that a range of it, um the, the core of the project i'm imagining i'm imagining it you know, because of the Morpeth school right the secondary yeah. school secondary school the bulk of the project and the core of the project happens in secondary school where um we work with um usually over like 100 kids um over an afternoon and yeah. um and that happens all year through um and it, then there is also an after school sort of project. Um, uh, in schools, there's an after school band that is usually a performance band that, that chooses it's like all the kids and they choose to be a part of something after, uh, after they um, get out of lessons for it. So in the beginning, they get out of lessons and then after they choose to be a part of it and also stay after school. And from there on, they can go on to another band, which is a training band, which doesn't happen in the school. It's sort of a collective of young people who um, choose to be a part of this and get right. invited to this next level band that is another level up. And then from there on, you can go to Drumheads, which is a semi-pro band. Um, and they, of course, choose to be there. And they play uh, the most insane music. Cool, and all of them perform and, and create their own music and... Well, all bands create and all bands um, are sort of creative cells in themselves. Um, so there's a lot of new material being made like all the time. Oh yeah, how do you keep up with it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty hardcore sometimes to remember all of the parts of all of the things. Um, yeah. And then you focus on a different beat for a little while, and then you have to go back to the old things. And yeah, I've I have many, many, many recordings on my phone and videos <laughs> of just like little parts and bits. And you know, and sometimes you look at something and go like, oh, did we actually continue writing this? Did, did yeah. we go in that direction, or did we? Yeah. So yeah, but it's a it's a well. Personally, it's a cool challenge, but it's also a good challenge for the young people that we work with because they also need to remember their own part that they have written. Um, it's a shared ownership thing. So yeah. If they don't remember, then you know it's not just on on us to remember all the things they all the things they make and they come up with. So. Very loud, like a stampede of elephants. You get to express yourself in ways that you can't do normally at home. I like the adrenaline rush. I like the sound. I think it's helped me like expand friendships. I feel like feeling stressed, you can lay it all out on the drum. It's kind of given me a lift of what I can do. I feel like it does take resilience. You have to be able to persevere. And I think that helps with all lessons at school. We're just holding the space for young people to work in the way that they want to work. We just 
feel so like unified. And then when you look around, everyone's just so happy. It makes you feel good inside. You don't go in and say, right, we're going to have a social impact today. We go in and say, we're going to make excellent music today. But you could feel the different ages. You maybe want to dance. Cool. And how, how does, how does the creative process work? Like, um, because they, you know, it's not like a drum kit where, you know, the kid says like, oh, I want a bass drum and the snare in this place, you know, like they all, they're all playing different instruments. So they need to really collaborate to get a groove going. Right. And yeah. how, yeah. how do you guys lead this process of lots of people playing different things to create, you know, a, a groove together and yeah, I mean, there's many, many ways to just to be like super clear. Drumworks uses four drums. They are Brazilian drums, but there's like a low sodu, a high sodu, a snare, and a pepinique, but a rep. We call it a rep. Just everything is English, uh, like anglified. Yeah. Um, the, um, um, so there's four parts to every beat. At, All right. Um, but of course, uh, like the, the low surdus, they sort of function as bass drums, so um, they can play the same part as well. And then the reps and the snares, they had the high drums, so they can play the same part as well. So initially, um, I guess in the very beginning of a writing process, but also in the very beginning of uh, a young person's development in creative yeah. sort of practice. Um, we don't go like, oh, here are yeah. all these. So you go all two these ways. Uh, it's just two. Or yeah. maybe even just one. Just everyone plays the same thing. Um, then we all create the same thing together, a pattern. Um, but then it's pretty, like, if you then, if something is flowing, it's, if when a groove is going, it's a lot easier to then engage with what, what potentially could be, what potentially could make this, um, even hipper, yeah. even cooler, even more energetic, yeah, yeah. Or even more like pretty much hands on. Then start, and then it's like, oh, if we change here, if we change there, and yeah, yeah. So it's through a lot of doing and through a lot yeah. of repetition, and that is, you know, what what drumming and like folk music, uh, the, these these things have. Like you do it, you get into it, you get really physically sort of attached to these music, music uh, these parts, and then. Then you start developing of what what possibilities could be. Yeah, oh, that's cool. And I'm sure like the the guys you work with like really get into like the groove things is a very kind of uh, appealing thing, isn't it? Like to to have like one little. I'm saying little. I know it's not it's not small, but like one responsibility in that mm. bar, you know. But then when you hear the totally like if it feels really engaging and and cool and you know like and physical as yeah, you said yeah. because you're engaged with other people and everything yeah how are you guys how are you guys are you guys doing anything during this crazy lockdown time like are you are you managing to do anything online how does that work online um oh, is it is it happening so, well because i've moved country now um yeah i am uh setting up drum with just like in beginning in the beginning in the early phases yeah. of that so we're not actually seeing people in the netherlands but before during the first lockdown um, yeah i was still with the english guys and um yeah so we went through a mad process of all beats that we have and there are many um being recorded by a few people who had uh, the facilities and the space to record them and all the drums with them as well. Um, and then that being processed and put into Ableton, which is a program um, that you can use to loop certain uh, loop material and like put things in order. Um, so we have um, the many, many beats um, just laid out on this page and we can trigger, um, I've got one here with uh, buttons like this so there might be like one beat here and then the next one there and the next one there and you can just trigger them um separate from each other separate parts from each other and um, because they've all been recorded like that um it's i'm calling it a mad process because we've 
I think there's something like 70 beats that have been recorded since we started. <laughs> and 70 beats have uh, all have four parts, um, like the, the 30, 230 parts and yeah. stand rep. Um, but then also all beats have breaks, all beats have B parts, C parts, uh, bridge yeah. section. So there's, there was um, an amazing amount of effort put into recording all of that. Yeah. That's cool. So, but then you did you use these recordings for uh, just to yeah. for them to practice and so, yeah. So then we see people on Zoom, so they can um, they uh, are invited to these Zoom sessions, and in Zoom you can. Oh um, uh, yeah, and then they play along. Basically. Yeah, so they yeah. Uh, at home had their own sticks or a practice yeah. pad or you know. Um, cardboard utensils and a pillow like it doesn't really matter yeah. and they can they were still engaging amazing um, yeah. yeah oh that's so cool um i'm just aware, aware of where at time and i would really want to uh because i know rio has like a uh, drum work heel and then he has other workshop leading heels that um i would like to explore <laughs> a little bit just to in order to to explore the, the differences and the the many hats that um, you know people like us need to wear and uh, and and I've been talking a lot about this in this connecting chat and just can we just have a look in what you do with musical beacons uh, with Soundcastle uh, give us a little overview quickly and then we're gonna try to make some connections and see if there are any connections to be made. Musical Beacons um, is a project in which we make music with families. So it's young, young kids, um, toddlers up to the age of seven usually, um, but it's open up to 12 years old, um, and their parents. Um, and so we make music together um, and aim for it to uh, be a shared responsibility within families and for them to bring the music back home. Um, when these ha sessions happened in real life, um, it was always a question whether the music went back home with them, but now we do sessions on Zoom um, and we see them actually making music and we see them getting out instruments or getting out things to play on and making instruments out of whatever they have around. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Mm. Yeah. yeah, really cool. And and if you compare like because they're both creative projects right where you create new music with these um guys and like what do you see in, in connection like one is like big drums being played really loud the other one is like finding objects at home and 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 people like sometimes like one year old six months year <laughs> old and uh you know, really little ones with young, with uh, brothers and sisters and parents, like very, very different vibe, I believe. And uh, what, what do you see that connects them in terms of your leading? Like, how can you, you know, go from one to the other without feeling completely an alien in, in a session? Yeah. Um... It's a really good question and it has taken me a while also for myself to connect these things within my practice um, but I've I think when you take a step back from both of these projects it's about expressing and asking someone to express themselves um, and allowing ways into doing that um, and allowing ways to connect with a certain instrument perhaps or with their own voices or with their own bodies to make music and to uh, communicate on a level that is just not with words, like a non-verbal communication mm. type. Um, and like, if you take a step back, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. It's just a different yeah. group of people that you need to probably communicate slightly differently with. Um, yeah. or quite and, differently with. Yeah. and the final, the final piece as well <laughs> might be different as well. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what I think that that's what, what I aim to do in both of these things is to um, make, I guess, make, make the people we work with like aware that they, if they take 
the responsibility of something that that it exists it, it's it's there it's and it's dead um and young people um they can take that step pretty easily because they're you know they're they're they've developed in in such a way that that they can just take charge of that and sometimes that's still a process and sometimes they just do that um, you mean young how like they're really really young with young people i mean uh young adults yeah so oh yeah, right yeah, yeah yeah okay young adults. and when you get to tiny kids of course you can't ask a baby to hold the beat down um so yeah. then <laughs> then you have to ask the parent to help or mm. um uh or uh, a young um you know a six or seven year old actually when you approach it in 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 the right way and with the right kind of musical activities i think there's a lot that they can do and and take responsibility over mm. um and take ownership of. so in that way um they can make the music themselves i think that that's where what i find important like they create something that they can yeah. play themselves that's cool I, yeah I, I forgot your i forgot your question just oh, no no is the, the connection yeah between like yeah. you know such like crazy out crazy differently I, yeah. the crazily different outcomes uh and probably approaches you know you know when you're in mm. in a secondary school with loads of drums you know it's it's noisy you know and when we are with young kids and their parents you know it's it's a um, it's very different uh, thing but but as you say I, I think there's this feeling for i don't know lots of people i talk about these things is is that we actually just do one thing right and uh, uh, which is like creating music with people and that's it and then but then like the approaches need to be so so yeah. different that some people might not want to yeah. yeah types of communication is um, is probably, you know, we all know what we want from people, but how to get there? Yeah, is, yes. Like the next level to, to like in the approaches. Yeah, because there's also a different project that I work with, um, just the parents. Um, mm. it's with, with Groundsall Arts, it's called the Lullaby Project, or Sing Our Story, it's called that. Um, and that I write a song after having a conversation with the parents, and that that's again a very different sort of strand, um, but I think connects all of those types of communications. Though is, if you are genuinely interested and genuinely, you know, talk from, an a sense of, uh, um, yeah, like genuine conversation making, um, where you where you trust the words that the people speak, whether they are seven. 14 yeah. or 35 if you believe them and you you show that you trust the, what they say i think um it opens up a lot of doors so oh that's amazing sometimes. that's really nice really nice thing to finish our conversation with very wise trust um the people you work with right and that, that's that's really beautiful here thank you so much let's do a thank connecting you. cheers to finish off this the amazing chats. <laughs> amazing. The last sip. Thank you so much, Hill, and I see you very soon. Yes, see you very soon. <laughs> Bye.